Hey there, fourth graders. I got something special for you today. We're going to be reading part of a book called Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky by Kwame Mbalia. And he is an up and coming African American illustrator and writer. As you can see by the cover of this book, he is an amazing artist. So this story is something that I think all of you will be really, really interested in. It is a fantasy. And I hope you remember what fantasy means. Fantasy, those are the types of books that cannot happen in our world. Some things in them may seem like they're real, like people are real and Tristan's person, but there's magic in fantasy books. There's also monsters, ghosts, mythical creatures and people. So this book fits all of those categories. Now, I think you'll really enjoy this because Tristan, he's a city boy, but he's going through a tough time, especially in the beginning of this book. Some tragedy has hurt Tristan really badly, and he's trying to recover from that tragedy. He also is a boxer, and he lost his first boxing match. That disappointed his dad and his granddad, who were boxers as well. Tristan wanted to carry on the family legacy of boxing. And now he doesn't think he can. He also doesn't really feel like he fits in anywhere anymore. And in order to try to get him out of his slump, his mom and dad send him to stay with his grandparents in Alabama for the summer. They want Tristan to get his confidence back and hopefully find his strength again. Well, will Tristan find his strength? And what is he going to find? on the farm in Alabama because as you can see behind me or behind the picture it looks like the sky looks a little strange in this story and can you really punch a hole in the sky and who is that man standing behind Tristan with the hammer and why are there chains being broken well you get to meet Tristan in just a minute I hope you really like him and I hope you love Kwame Balia's uh, new story that weaves together so much folklore from the African-American experience. Here we go. Chapter one, the car ride. There was a rhythm in my fist, pop, pop. It told a story, pop, pop. Everybody thought they knew the story. They'd seen it before. He'll get over it. It's a phase, give him space. But they only knew fragments. They didn't want to hear the rest. Oh, you do? Hmm. Well, what if I told you that I went to war over my dead best friend's glowing journal? Or that I battled monsters, big and small, with powers I didn't know I had? With gods I didn't know existed? Would you believe me? Nah, you wouldn't. You got your own problems. You don't want to hear about my struggles. Right? Oh, you do? Well, I gotta warn you, it's a wild ride, so buckle up, champ. Let me give you some truth. And I hope it returns back to me. Tristan, they're here! Pop! Mom's shout interrupted my groove. I stopped pummeling the small punching bag Dad had installed in my room and loosened the straps on my boxing gloves with my teeth. The gloves fell on the bed, and I dropped down next to them. Eddie's journal sat on my tiny desk in the opposite corner, still glowing, still and open since his mother had given it to me after the funeral two weeks ago. My room was so small, I could have reached out and grabbed the leather book, but that would mean dealing with it. And who deals with their problems by choice? <sighs> Not me. Tristan Strong, my dad yelled from the downstairs hall. I hated that name. It made me appear to be something I'm not. My name should have been Tristan Coward, or Tristan Failure, or Tristan Fake. Maybe Tristan, how could you lose your first boxing match? Anything but Tristan Strong. Mom's footsteps echoed through our tiny apartment, and then soft knocking sounded on my door. Tristan, baby, did you hear me? I cleared my throat. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I'm coming. The door opened and Mom peeked in. She was still wearing the Team Strong t-shirt from last night. I don't think any of us had gotten much sleep after we came back from my first bout. I stayed up nursing my pride. The only thing I really injured. My little fan club, 
Dad, Mom, and my grandparents on Dad's side had tried to cheer me up, but I could see the disappointment written on everyone's faces, so I pretended to go to bed while they held whispered discussions into the wee hours of the morning. And now it was dawn. Time to get this show on the road. Mom's eyes took in the organized chaos of my room and crinkled when they landed on me. She crossed the floor in two steps, avoiding yesterday's untouched dinner in the process, and sat down on the mattress. It's only for a month, she said. Not even play Kate, play acting that she didn't know what was wrong. I know. It'll be good for you to get away. I know. She rubbed my head, then pulled me into a hug. The grief counselor said it would be good to get a change of scenery, some fresh air, work around the farm. Who knows, maybe you'll find out you were meant to work the land. I shrugged. The only thing I was sure of was that I wasn't meant to be a boxer, despite what Dad and Granddad thought. I pulled free of Mom's hug, stood, grabbed my duffel bag, and headed out to start my month of exile. Aren't you forgetting something? Mom asked. I turned, and she held Eddie's journal out to me. Her hand and wrist were bathed in the emerald green glow that was coming from the cover, but like everyone else I'd shown the journal to, she didn't notice any strange light. Mom mistook my confused frown for apprehension as she slipped the book into my bag. He wanted you to have it, Tristan. I know it's tough, but try to read it when you can, okay? I didn't trust myself to speak, so I nodded and headed to the front door. The decision to ship me to Granddad and Nana Strong's farm down in Alabama had been made without my input. Typical. My parents had talked about it a few times before, but after Eddie's death and my third school fight in the final two weeks before summer break, well, I guess the time was right. At least I'd held my own in those school fights, unlike in the ring last night. It was just my luck that my grandfather had been there to witness my humiliation. You outweighed that other kid by seven pounds, Granddad had said after the match in his growling rasp of a voice. Set the family name back by a decade. That's me, Tristan Disappointment. Son of Alvin Reckonball Strong, the best middleweight boxer to come out of Chicago in nearly 20 years. I had dad's height and granddad's chin, and boxing was supposed to run in my veins. I'd worn granddad's old trunks, and dad had worked my corner. The strong legacy was expected to take another leap forward Dreen, my first match. Instead, it got knocked flat on its butt. Twice. You'll get it next time, was all Dad said, but I could tell he was let down. That hurt almost as much as getting punched. An early summer heat wave greeted me with a blast of humidity as I left the apartment building with my backpack over my shoulder and my duffel bag in my hand. Thick gray clouds huddled in the distance, and I added that to the list of the totally not ominous things. Glowing journal, yep. Storm on the horizon, yep, you betcha. Dad and Granddad stood at the curb while Nana, no, no one ever called a grandma, not if you wanted to eat, knitted in the car. Dad towered over his father, but you can still see the family resemblance. Deep brown skin like mine, a wide jaw, and a proud stance. I got my hair from my mom's side of the family, thankfully, because both strong men had identical bald spots peeking through their short afros. Get him in the fields and put him to work, Granddad was saying. That'll put some fire in his belly. Dad shrugged and said nothing. To be fair, no one did much talking when Granddad was around. That old man could yak a mile a minute. Nana saw me coming down the stairs, dropped her knitting, and rushed out of the car. There he is! How you doing today, baby? Are you sore from last night? She gave me a hug that muffled my answer, then shooed Granddad to the side. Get the boy's bag, Walter. Alvin! She said, addressing my father. We've got to hit the road before that thunderstorm hits. Granddad looked me up and down. Is that all you kids ever wear? I glanced down 
black Chuck Taylors with gray untied laces, loose khaki cargo shorts, and an even looser gray hoodie. That hoodie went with me everywhere. It had a picture of a flexed bicep on the back, faded black ink. Call me sentimental, but it's what I always wore when Eddie and I were hanging out. He called it the Tristan Strong uniform of choice, preferred for all occasions. So yeah, I wear it a lot. Nana shushed him and pulled me into another hug. Don't you listen to him, Tristan. I can't wait to have you back with us on the farm. You were so little last time, but them chickens you used to chase still haven't forgotten you. I packed a lunch and even rustled up a new story or two for the ride. And just so, just like that, with a clap on the shoulder from Dad and a hug from Mom, I was someone else's problem for a month. Goodbye, Chicago, and all your glorious cable TV, internet, and cell phone service. I hardly knew you. One thing became very clear. During the 12-hour car ride to Alabama, I was never going to do this again. Never, ever. Sitting in an enclosed space with Granddad was like wiping your tears on sandpaper. Painful, excruciating, even when you wondered why you ever thought it was a good idea. Oh, think I'm playing? Ten minutes into the trip, when I was your age, I had a full-time job and already fought in two little fights. Three hours in. Oh, you're hungry again? Did you bring some stopping for snacks money? Six hours in. Man, I shouldn't have ate those leftover beans for breakfast. Eight hours in. Can't believe I drove all this way to see a strong boy fight so soft. That's your grandmother's side of the family. Ain't no strong ever look like that in the ring. Why, I remember. Anyway, you get it. By the time we crossed the Alabama state line, I was ready to claw my way into the trunk. I don't know how Nana could just sit there and hum and knit for most of the day, but that's what she did. The Cadillac rumbled down a two-lane highway, kicking up trails of dust and exhaust, a dented rocket ship blasting through time in reverse from the future to a land that Wi-Fi forgot. I put my earbuds in somewhere back in Kentucky, but the battery on my phone had long since run out. I just kept them in so no one would bother me. Nana kept knitting in the passenger seat, and Granddad tapped a finger on the steering wheel, humming along to a song only he could hear. Things seemed more or less calm, except for one thing. Eddie's journal sat on the seat next to me. Now, I could have sworn I stuffed the book under the clothes of my duffel bag, which Granddad had put in the trunk. And yet, here it was, waiting on me to do something I'd put off since the funeral. The late afternoon sun, occasionally peeking out from behind the storm clouds, made the journal look normal, ordinary. But every so often, I'd shade the cover with my hands and peek at it while holding my breath. Yup, still glowing. Why not open it, you might ask, and see what's inside? Well, believe me, it wasn't that simple. Before Eddie's death, the cover of his brown leather journal had always been blank. Now a weird symbol appeared to be stitched into it like a sun with rays that stretched out to infinity or a flower with long petals. The same symbol was embossed on a carved wooden charm that dangled from a cord around attached to the journal's spine. I'd seen the tassel before. Eddie used it to mark his spot or to flick me in the back of the head, but the charm was new. And even more weirdly, the trinket pulsed with green light, too. I've been staring at that book every day for minutes on end, but the glow always stopped me from opening it. I mean, I knew what was in there anyway. The stories Eddie had jotted down in his goofy, blocky handwriting from his own silly creations to the fables my Nana used to tell us when we were younger. When she'd come up to visit, John Henry and Nancy the Spider, Br'er Rabbit's Adventures, I'd read them all. Our end of semester English project was supposed to be a giant collection of stories from our childhood. Eddie was doing the writing, and I was going to give the oral presentation. Then the accident happened. The counselor mom took me to every Wednesday had said I should try to finish the writing part, even though school was now over for the year, as a part of healing and other stuff. Before you say something slick, you might regret. 
Mr. Mr. Richardson's pretty cool for a counselor. You get me? We play Madden while we talk, which means I can focus on running up the score on his raggedy eagle squad and not on being embarrassed about answering questions. It helps some. If it gets too tough, he knows when to back off too. So you can keep your sensitive and man up comments to yourself, chumps. To avoid thinking about the haunted journal, I watched the weather outside the car window. The clouds never let up. Even once we were in the deep south, they just switched from hurling lightning bolts at us to hurling fat drops of rain that splattered across the windshield like bugs. Everything everywhere was miserable, and that pretty much summed up my life at the moment. I took off the earbuds and sighed. <sighs> Nana heard me, and turned around in her seat to look at me. Are you hungry, sweetie? She asked. No, not really. No, ma'am. Granddad's deep voice rolled back from the driver's seat. You answer no, ma'am, to your grandma. You understand? Yeah. Granddad looked at me in the rearview mirror. I, I mean, yes, sir. He held my eyes a moment longer and then went back to looking out at the road. Well, Nana continued, turning around and picking up her knitting. Despite what your granddad said earlier, she gave him a glare. Let me know when you are hungry. Your mama told me you ain't been eating too much and we're gonna fix that. And don't you have some writing to do? That's what your counselor wants you to focus on. Boy, that boy don't need no counselor, Granddad rumbled. He needs to work. Ain't no time for mopping and moping when horses need feeding and fences need mending. Walter, Nana scolded. He needs to... I know what he needs. I shook my head and stopped paying attention. After spending a day in the car with them, I realized that this was what they did. They argued, they laughed, they sang, they argued again, and then they knitted. Well, Nana knitted, but they were two sides of the same old coin. With Granddad, everything was about work. Work, work, work. Bored? Here's some work. Finished working? Here's more work. Need someone to talk to? Obviously, that meant you didn't work hard enough, so you know what? Have a little bit more work. Nana, on the other hand, sang and hummed when she wasn't talking, which almost never happened because she always had a new story to share. Do you know why the owls can't sleep? She'd say, and off the story would go, and you'd sit there and listen, just being polite at first. But by the end, you'd be on the edge of your seat. I smiled. Eddie had loved listening to my grandmother. When she'd come home to visit earlier this year, he'd practically followed her around, his journal in hand. Speaking of which, my left hand rested on top of it in the seat, seat next to me, and I traced the symbol stitched into the front cover. What was that, sweetie? I looked up to see Nana peeking back over the seat. Hmm, I mean, uh, 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 yes, ma'am. Granddad nodded, and I let out a sigh of relief. Nana smiled. Is that for your writing? I hesitated. Yes, ma'am. I held up the book so she could see it, and her eyes widened at the symbol on the cover. Where'd you get that? She asked. Granddad turned to see what, was she, what she was looking at, but Nana flapped a hand at him. Watch the road, Walter. Uh, I got it from Eddie, began, and then paused. I mean, his mom gave it to me. It, it, it is, was for us. For a school project. Why? What's wrong? Could she see it? Could she tell that the book was glowing even in the daylight? Nana pursed her lips. Well, that symbol, I just hadn't seen it in a long time. Do you know what it is? Well, she glanced at Granddad, who turned us out as soon as we started talking about writing. It's, it's a spider's web, an old African symbol for creativity and wisdom. It shows how tangled and complicated life can be. But with a little imaginative thinking, we can solve our own problems and those of others. Do you notice anything else about the journal? I asked her. Nana laughed, a bright, joyous sound, 
that infected anyone listening. Is this a test? No, ma'am. I don't see nothing but procrastination. Go ahead and give it a try. Yes, ma'am, frowned. So Nana could see the symbol, this spider web, but not that it was glowing. Well, that didn't make me feel any better. Granddad smacked the steering wheel. Y'all need to stop filling his head with that mess about symbols. He needs to stay in the real world. Think about what he did wrong last. The boy need to focus. Boxing ain't just gonna happen. You gotta train your body and your mind. Granddad, I don't want... I don't want to hear it. You're not a kid anymore. You're strong. And... Walter, Nana interrupted. Don't be so hot on the boy. He needs some toughening up. Y'all been too soft on him. Now look. Nana started whisper lecturing Granddad and shook his head and grumbled beneath his breath. I slid down in my seat, tried to block out the argument. I let my thumb trace the cover of the journal, and before my brain could tell me not to, I yanked it into my lap and flipped to a random page. So what if it glowed? It was still a book, and reading it would be better than listening to any more Granddad's insults disguised as life lessons, or reliving that bus accident. I mean, really, what could go wrong?